Hello and welcome to Self-Sufficient Conversations. I am your host, Natalie, and we will be talking with Annalise from New Zealand NZ Homesteading in this week's episode in our podcast series, where we explore what self-sufficiency means to others. Annalise homesteads in New Zealand on her lifestyle block, and we will talk to her today about how she lives a self-sufficient life. Can you please talk to us today about what self-sufficiency looks like for you? For me over here, I am just kind of starting. We've been rearing and doing home kill and those things for as long as I can remember red meat. Like Mm -hmm. I can't remember the last time we went and bought red meat. Okay. Um, Most of that's through like sheep, beef, and we do go do a bit of hunting with like venice deer venison and things like that um and fishing and Mm -hmm. my partner loves diving so the meat kind of side is pretty much covered what Mm -hmm. we really buy meat wise is um bacon okay (laughs) yeah and chicken yeah i do not want (laughs) i've looked looked after um pigs before and Mm -hmm. i'm not getting a pig (laughs) <laughs> um, I just don't they're the one animal that I just don't get along with um I agree chicken, <laughs> we eat like we'll eat wild pork but mm. um yeah then I'm not rearing them um chickens we've just ordered our first lot of meat chickens exciting so they come I know they come <laughs> as um day old chicks mm-hmm so I'm going to, I've got day old um, layer hens coming as well. Nice. So they're all coming together. So that's a new one. Meat mm-hmm. chickens. Haven't yeah. done that before. Yeah. They but, can be a little um, bit temperamental. They can just die for no reason. Um, yeah. Oh. The last lot we got, we had a hundred percent success rate. Um, but the batch prior, I think we lost 30%. And it's usually really? lose, lose about 20 or 25%. Um, yeah, they can just, because they grow so fast. Yeah, because they grow so, they're bred to grow real quick. Um, they Their bodies can't handle it though. We had one with a hip come out yeah. um, and we had to put oh. her down. Yeah. And then we had just some just randomly, their hearts couldn't keep up with it. But the meat is completely different to supermarket meat. Um, even with um, the uh, meat birds. So we have done hens or roosters before and the meat's different again. It's really dark and a little bit tough. These ones are really tender still, but the meat, because you don't bleach it at home, it's still pink and brown and um, and it's got more flavour compared to a supermarket bird that tastes like nothing. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's exciting. Yeah. And um, we haven't done the whole rooster eating thing because mm. um, I've never I've never had any birds that are even remotely meat birds. Like they're yeah. always kind of laying birds. Um, so mm. the rooster's out of those. Yeah, there's not much on them. <laughs> no. Um, we some a guy did come out though when I had a few I had about five and I was okay. like oh, what can I do with <laughs> but a guy came out from town and he was like I'll take them so awesome. I was like yeah I'd rather he took them yeah and he ate them than mm-hmm. if I just killed them and put them in a hole like I'd rather there was yeah. some use for them. yeah yeah we had someone come out and do the same apparently there's a Burmese community out here and they love those sorts of chickens they're like the gamier um, very lean, not much meat on them, kind of chicken, yeah. which is probably more traditional to what people ate. And we've just bred this super yeah. bird with lots of flesh and tenderness. <laughs> but that's all I've ever known. And so eating um, like a rooster isn't pleasurable, and I rather not. I rather not eat it. So if I was yeah. going to have chicken, I don't mind these meat birds for that. <laughs> Oh, I'm, we only got a few, like a small number to start mm. with because 
best to start small when it is. you have these things. Yeah. We don't. We've never done it before. So you've got to yeah. start somewhere. Yeah. And killing um, them is a process. So we've got it down yeah. to 15 minutes from pen to freezer. Um, but in yeah. the beginning, I think the first one took like an hour. <laughs> really? <laughs> we, we do a lot of um, duck shooting during the mm. season. So yeah. I'm kind of basing it off, it'll be like similar yeah. to that. Well, so. at least you've got experience with poultry. So, yeah. Well, far enough. <laughs> Hopefully it won't take you an hour like a dinner. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> um, do you use the um, what do you call wild pigs over there is it hogs as well no just wild pigs okay do you use those yeah. for bacon like would you make your own bacon with those um, we have would not recommend I think <laughs> out of the whole time we've been here the whole time no my whole life really We've done a few into bacon and I've only ever had one good one. Okay. Like one that I would fry up for breakfast and eat it. <laughs> but um, the others, they had so hit and miss. And like the pigs in different areas, they're so different. Mm. Like meat wise, like meat and fat. Like the, yeah. we had some friends come down from the North Island and they caught a pig um, in the South Island on their way here and they brought it round and it was honestly beautiful. Okay, yeah. Like, <laughs> better than tame pork. Um, and love that. I think we've already had most of it. We might have one roast left. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's hit and miss. Really hit and miss. Okay, yeah. We have never had wild pig. I don't think you really get wild pigs down where I am. They're more of an up north yeah. thing. Um, Probably a good thing. It is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long have you been growing for? Not that long. Um, yeah. <laughs> I started when we first came here. When we first came here, it was about six years ago, five, six years ago. And like mum had a veggie garden and stuff when we were growing up, just a small one. And I was like, oh, I've got all this space. I'll put a veggie garden. In. <laughs> and I think we had an old shed that had burnt down. There was like a wall frame mm -hmm. just sitting, standing up in there, but like all charred. Yeah. And I was like, that'll make That'll make a good veggie garden. <laughs> so I got the boys and drag it down to the other end of the section for me and put it there. And that was my first veggie garden. Yeah. <laughs> Filled it up with compost and everything. But then I finally got, um, we had some, what do you call it, kind of reclaimed just old wood lying around and um, built a raised boxes. Mm hmm so we were able to do that on the cheap because we didn't have to pay for the wood. Yeah. Um, which would, otherwise building them, if you don't have access to cheap, good wood, mm. it can actually get really expensive so quickly. Yeah. Um, so I've had that for two or three, year, three years now. Mm -hmm. And it's not huge. I was going to go measure it this morning <laughs> and I was like, oh my it's not big at all yeah um and then I think it was and um, it's less than a year ago I decided I wanted to make it bigger mm. so I put a ground um garden in so that has been an experience in itself because <laughs> it's like I don't know it's just way different to gardening in a raised bed yeah um and but the best thing about it is it's cheap to set up yeah um you, all we've got to really do is just add add layers on top of it and you're pretty sweet like yeah. there's no expense involved. um we're on clay here mm -hmm. so we've got maybe uh i'd say like five inches topsoil okay nice so once once you dig through that first five or so inches 
it's just rock hard clay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think just the top soil is really, you know, I've got maybe an inch say, if I'm lucky. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I'd say that probably because it's right next to the house, so I'm assuming that when the house was put in, mm. a heap of the top soil kind of got spread out everywhere. Yeah. So there is probably a solid four or five inches on top there. Yeah, um, wow. So we put spuds in there. This is my first year growing spuds. No. I'm going to do it every single year. <laughs> it's so easy. Yeah. Um, get so much out of it. Yeah. Um, my growing space is huge. Like my ground garden is maybe six meters long by three meters wide. Mm-hmm. That's in the ground. Um probably less than that like it's not big and then yeah. the raised bed that is smaller yeah wow and the um the pumpkins they're just they're just out in a paddock that we had locked up no nice. so yeah not really taking up any room at all no so you're able to live pretty self-sufficiently off your veggie patch um it's hard to say yet I wouldn't say Right now, no. Yeah. Um, but as you kind of, like, we can definitely supplement a heap of our food through the veggie garden. Yeah. But being fully self-sufficient on it, no. Nah. Not yet, yeah. Yet. Not yeah. yet. Yeah. 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 It, it is a pre- one day, but. It is a process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's. It's learning about yourself as well, like Mm. what you are actually going to eat and how much you're actually going to eat. Yeah. Like we put these spuds in randomly because we normally will buy a bag of spuds a week. Yeah. Um, And we just, we whack them in. We didn't do any like calculations or anything like Mm. that to see how much we're going to need. Yeah. Um, I'm... It's going to be interesting to see how long the spuds will last us because they store quite easily for yeah. quite a long time. Um, I think I've pulled half of them out. And once they were ready to eat, I think we had been a month and a half, or two months, we'd only eaten four plants. Yeah. So it was like I was thinking – if I need for the two of us for a whole year, yeah, I'm going to need to put in an acre of spuds. <laughs> but if you like add it up from that, no, we're probably not really too far off considering yeah. like when you can harvest the, another crop after that. Yeah. Like it's, it's surprising what you do and don't actually need to plant like quantity wise. Mm. Agreed. I um I always overplant. I'm a yeah, I'm a cereal overplanter. <laughs> <laughs> um partly because I have the space and I don't like having empty space. It's a it's a flaw. <laughs> um but because I do then take my excess and share it with my neighbors and barter and sell it, um, I figure yeah. that I might as well be growing in that space. Um, but you know, at the moment. I have eight zucchini plants and 15 more just about to come on. And I'm getting, you know, 10 kilos every other day. And I saw those zucchini is like <laughs> even giving them away. It's, it's difficult at the moment. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that is a lot. It is a lot. I think I put in three zucchini plants. Mm. Enough for us. Yeah, like I've already started <laughs> freezing a heap of it, and like because it's funny, like seasonal, the chickens will start laying mm. in that warmer time. They start laying way better. Yeah, and then like all your zucchinis and things come on, and then it's just like bulk the zucchini quiche for everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, uh. so sick of it. <laughs> Um, we were chatting, um, off air about prices, food prices in New Zealand. And, um, 
the Australian and the NZ dollar, they're pretty on par with each other when you're comparing them back to the US dollar. Um, I think the New Zealand dollar is a little bit higher than Australian. Um, but I have seen um, through other people I follow on Instagram about um, the expensive veggies um, in, or how expensive veggies are in New Zealand. So um, I saw that zucchinis can go up to $27 a kilo, which is absolutely insane. Um, you know, <laughs> a couple of bucks here um, in summer, even in winter, because they're grown in, in Queensland in, in winter, in Victorian winter. Um, they're not much more expensive than that. But I'd love to do a little bit of a comparison on prices if you roughly know um, prices. I'll have, I'll, I've brought it up on here. So, oh, um, yes. Well, I'll do the same. Um, I'll jump on to Woolworths Online because I think yeah. you have Woolworths over there too. Um, no, we Back don't. Way. I think um, they maybe own like some of our chain stores. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, mine's taking a little bit um, of time to load. Here we go. Okay. So I'm going to go in and search for zucchinis and see what they're retailing for at the moment. And over here they are $2.90. Sorry. I'll try that again. <laughs> that was for 750 grams. So for a kilo, they're $3.87. Really? Yeah. <laughs> There's still $7 here. Oh, wow. That's like double the price. <laughs> Do you have farms over there that would grow market garden crops? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Um, I'm not... I'm not real clued up on it to be fair but I know that there is and we have a lot of like you don't always need like this that price that I'm looking at is like a big supermarket yeah kind yeah. of company price yeah but I don't know what it would be if like you went to like the fruit we call them fruit and fruit and veg store yeah <laughs> they same. just do fruit and veg <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know what, I think maybe it would be a bit different pricing if you went there. Yeah. Yep. But I'd say like over 50% of Kiwis would just do their fruit and veg shopping at yep. our big supermarket. Yeah. Same with Aussies. Um, I, when I go in there for, you know, my spices and some grains, you see trolley fulls of, of fruit and veg from the supermarket. And when I first moved to this town, um, the closest large town is 30 30 minutes away and I didn't know where the fruit and veggie shop was because it was tucked away in an industrial area and no, um, that's the same as yeah and so when I was doing my my weekly shops I was like oh my gosh this is killing me shopping at Woolies for everything like for meat and for um and for veg we we're just spending like three four hundred bucks a week on food yeah um and, and then for how big a family is that for so we've got five in our family but um you know when we moved here one of them was two four and yeah. um seven so still not huge eaters at that stage um mm. and when I finally made some friends because you know we homeschool so it's a little bit <laughs> slower to make friends in the homeschooling community um, rather than just going to school and seeing mums there. Um, I was able to ask someone and they were, they were able to tell me about, you know, a good fruit and veg shop, the only one, <laughs> um, yeah. where you could halve your fruit and veggie bill just by, you know, supporting really? an independent grocer. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Was, it was pretty insane. Um, Shall we move on to a different um, veggie and see what yep. they, <laughs> is that too depressing if we go through this? <laughs> I don't know. It's, we'll see. Maybe after about three, we'll go ahead and stop. <laughs> it's, I want to lead it into uh, it, why um, no, like why aren't more New Zealanders growing their own food? Because at those prices, 
it just makes sense to have a little veggie patch to supplement, um, you know, your weekly food shop, I guess. Yeah. Um, I am looking at capsicums now and we're looking at 5 90 for a kilo of red capsicums. For a kilo. For a How kilo. many is that? It's like five. That'd be quite a few. Are you five, de- <laughs> five or six decent ones. We might, we have to pay that in winter for one. Wow. That's pretty And at the moment, it's $2 each. That's one. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it just makes sense to grow your own. Some of your own, if you can, especially for zucchinis. Like, they are so prolific Um, and so easy. I find them one of the easiest veg to grow. Not everyone says that, but they're a big seed. Um, They're pretty hardy. They do well in my climate. If you're a first-time gardener, plant a zucchini plant and you'll feel like you've achieved so much (laughs) yeah agreed and then you're saving you know seven bucks a kilo a week and they're pretty versatile like you can shove them in just about everything (laughs) oh my god how much was your capsicum again five dollars ninety for a kilo oh my god um how about potatoes you spoke about growing um quite a su- mm. like substantial amount of potatoes and um yeah. last year with covid our potato prices went up because everyone everyone was buying them to store and um then we had some flooding oh, a couple of years ago and um that really affected a lot of potato farmers in the region um and potato prices really went up then too. Um, but I think they're back down now. I haven't bought potatoes for ages. Um, but they're about three fifty a kilo. Um, look. I guess uh, maybe they're – we don't often buy them loose. Yeah, and we buy them in like a pre five ten kilo bag. Yeah, um, but we have noticed the price of them in just this last summer kind of period. They've gone up. Yeah. Um, on here it's saying about three dollars a kilo for okay. loose ones. Okay. Which isn't too bad. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Last year with but, the panic yeah. buying. Um, a lot of people started preserving and growing their own seed, like growing their own veg and buying the seeds to do that, which is all great. Like it's not a bad thing. Um, it just happened so quickly that none of the supply chains could keep up with it basically. Um, but yeah. food um, and veg, um, particularly veg, but all food has gone up quite significantly here. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's, it's the same over there. Yeah. It's um, like, yeah. Um, you um, also have a cow due to carve really soon. Would you like no. to talk to No. Just looking at her out the window. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's, um, she, I bought her two, uh, two, two years ago. Um, so she's two years old now. Um, it was probably out of A, lack of research, and B, <laughs> like vanity, like she looks cute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I got her. Um, she is, she was always destined to be my house cow. Nice. Um, over here, I, I don't know anyone that has a house cow. <laughs> Like it's not a thing. Yeah. Um, because New Zealand makes we've got all the dairy farms over here yeah. and things like that. But but that doesn't mean like our milk is cheap. Like we're over here, a 500 gram block of butter is we're lucky to get it under five bucks. Okay, it's same price. So, yeah, so five bucks for a 
500 grand block yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when you're starting this homesteading thing and you're doing all this cooking and stuff, that mm. adds up real quick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There was one stage we had a couple other people living here with us and we were going through a whole bottle of milk a day. Yeah, wow. Um, and a whole thing of yogurt a week. So I had like all the dairy things adding up. Mm. <laughs> and I so Bella is a, she's out of the dairy cow. We call yep. them a Kiwi cross. They're like a Frisian and a Jersey kind of okay. mixed together. Um but they put a white Galloway bull over here. So yeah. White Galloways, they're like the belted Galloways, kind of different color. Um, yeah. And which is kind of no offense to anyone that has them, but they're kind of these <laughs> resource brand. They, like, they look real cool. They do. Like, they're real cool. <laughs> uh, Apart from that, like they're quite small. Yeah. Um, I don't know like what their meat is like or anything like they're that. They're supposed but... to be good. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've got three Galloway um, steers. And oh, here I am. Yeah. The same <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've also, we got them because they were cute. I got them because they were cute at the auctions. Yeah. And then the rest we've got at Angus. Yeah. Um, but I think why people buy them here is if you're on a hobby farm and you've got five, 10 acres, they're much smaller and you don't need as much pasture for them. So I think that's yeah. the reason why they sell well here, but apparently their meat's good. <laughs> I made that same um, argument when we were driving down the road and we drove past a heap of low line Angus, mm. which are like a miniature Angus, not yeah. like a miniature, miniature, they're smaller. Yeah. Um, and my partner was like, what the hell do people want those for? And I was like, <laughs> well, and I just said exactly what you just said. So, yeah. You know, but I'm hoping that Bella's going to, um, she's in calf to an Angus. Mm-hmm. So we breed Angus as well. Yeah. Um, he has thrown, he does throw all the time really little calves. So it's okay. ideal really for her yeah. being a time carver. I'm just fingers crossed, like, she's going to let me milk her. <laughs> like, she's so quiet and friendly. Nice. Um, but it'll just be a, um, they call it share milking. So oh, yes, yes. I get some, the calf gets some. Yeah. So the calf is staying on her. So I don't know, being like that beef breed, having that Galloway in her, if that's going to um, kind of hold like have a lower milk production in mm. it like obviously now if I was getting a house cow I'd just go get a jersey cow yeah but at the time <laughs> Eric, my partner my partner was like you're not getting a jersey like this is quite <laughs> we beat breed beef like we're not getting a jersey <laughs> so um that's how that happened um. <laughs> So is it dependent on teat size to get your hands or your machine onto the teats or is it really just volume? Do you think that would be the? I think like associated to like milk production, you mean? Yeah, or even just being able to milk her. Being able to milk her, teat size does matter. Um, Obviously the bigger they are and we're talking like the teat not the udder yeah yeah um she if they're bigger they're going to be easier to milk if they're yeah. smaller you still milk it but obviously if they're like minuscule <laughs> like you wouldn't even read from it um you you wouldn't it'd be a struggle but mm. I think breed is breed is definitely the biggest factor of okay it. Yeah, and then different breeds have um, different amounts of cream and things like that. Like yeah. jerseys will give you a heap more cream than what a straight Frisian would. Yeah, that's true. Yep, and we notice that from yeah times that we've bought jersey to Frisian milk. Um, yeah, you yeah. notice the difference to to the cream and the color. Like jersey milk, so yellow, and the Frisian milk yeah. is like white as 
I know. And the butter people make from um, Jersey cream is like mm. yellow, yellow yeah. butter. Like you look at the robot stuff and it looks white almost. <laughs> Um, are milk prices crazy in New Zealand? So going back to the, the food prices because you do have a lot of the dairies there. Yeah. Um, I know it's $3 something. I just have another look though. They used to be more expensive here. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, oh, how long ago? Probably about 11, 12 years ago. Um, milk was subsidized. Sub- sorry. <laughs> Milk was subsidised by the big major supermarkets and it went down to a dollar a litre, which sounds wonderful for the consumer. And, of course, if there's a dollar a litre milk and if there's, like, $5 a litre milk, you choose a dollar a litre milk because you've got a budget you need to stick to. Um, Mm. But it was really, really detrimental to farmers, and I guess that's the same with everything. We're talking cheap chicken, cheap pork. Um, It's all relative Mm. and someone down the line is getting is getting screwed and it's certainly not the supermarket that's losing out um and so yeah it's interesting to see that you guys still have um fair prices for the farmer so we're talking about how crazy prices are but there's a Mm. lot of work that goes in the dairy because we live in dairy country and we've got two dairies bordering us i see how late they work and how hard they yeah. work. <laughs> how early they work and yeah. um, over cab net, they work so hard. Yeah, 24-7 basically. <laughs> yeah. I've uh-huh. worked on, I've never done a carving on a dairy farm, but I have worked on a couple of them. Mm. Um, and it's good to go and get the experience and kind of, it's always nice to know, no matter what it is, who's making your food. Yeah. Like who's handling the animals, what the animals look like, how they're treated and everything like that. Um, so it's, I'm quite thankful that I've had the experience on a dairy farm. Mm. and But having my own house cow isn't just because it's hard to talk about dairy farming because I feel like it's a very <laughs> sensitive topic. Um, yeah New Zealand oh okay yeah um it's I want a house cow because I and there's come there's other dairy companies out here in New Zealand that do this they keep the calf on the cow okay um and they sell the milk that way Mm -hmm. but they're so like boutique and I don't think there's many at like available at a store um yeah I only so know of I one. Like, I only know of one dairy farm in all of Australia that does that. Yeah, which is insane. So it's quite a rare thing. And, yeah, um, it's not just. And I know some farmers that don't like that fact either, but that mm. is kind of how it's done. Um, mm. But yeah, and I, I don't like the. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. Just, like, <laughs> there's, there's a whole heap of stuff like the bobby calf market and things yes, like yeah. that. Um, but it's not only like taking the cow off mum, uh, taking the calf off mum. It's it's still done in like any milking aspect, whether it's goats mm-hmm. or sheep or whatever yeah. you're milking. Um, but it's, I was talking to a friend that's actually a dairy farmer. Mm-hmm. And um, she was saying, we were talking about it and we kind of came to the realisation now that when you are breeding beef cows, Mm. you're you're picking for a heap of things, but amongst those things is um, her mothering ability. Yeah. She's a good mum. She's going to rear her own calf. Mm -hmm. It's the last thing you want to do is have to rear a calf. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Dairy cows... They don't get picked on a mothering ability. Mm. So now when they take the calves off them, sometimes it's the best thing for it because their mothering instinct has almost been bred out of a lot of them. Yeah, wow. And um, I've seen videos and people talking about it of the cut, the cows will turn around and basically like try and kill their own calf. Wow. It's it's so backwards, but 
it's just like the chickens we were talking about before yeah. the meat chickens like that's how you're going to breed them yeah like you can pick on the specific like um attributes but mm. you just pick on those you're going to miss out on some other stuff eventually yeah but um so it's 50 50 really like mm. you can't leave the calf out there if mum's going to kill it so you do have to take it off but yeah <laughs> it's a hard one yeah, yeah it is and it's the same, like, if you were to then go through, and I suppose this is where vegans have their beef with meat eaters and, and you know, everything, um, but we could pick apart, part, um, you know, so, like agriculture for soy, for example, like, you know, it's, it's for everything. When you look at everything on a commercial scale, for example, pork, and you're putting them in sour mm-hmm. stalls, um, when you're feeding people on mass and you're trying to do it cheaply there's flaws in it all and so you know yeah. going back to basics and doing it yourself you, you have control on how you treat your animals um yeah. what you pump into them or don't pump into them and um their quality of life and even yeah like i said soy you know how much forest has been cleared to grow soy to meet the needs of um processed foods um that we all like soy's in everything like it's not just vegans that eat soy soy's in everything um but that's really destructive too i feel that's really destructive too um always gonna be like that if you're trying to feed umpteen million people yeah they want to take they want to take no responsibility of their own food because a lot of people don't yeah yeah um you preserve some of your own food was that right yep but we do um I do my tomatoes um I've only done it started it last year the whole preserving thing yeah but I've learned so much since then so <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it's giving the time to do it but yeah preserving and um preserving in like shelf stable you know like in the jars and mm. everything like that like a lot of people do it because it looks pretty but, yeah um, <laughs> there's a lot of work in that and yeah <laughs> and you have to think about like I was having this conversation with someone else the other day that um we we're talking about tinned tomatoes yeah. and the fact that tinned tomatoes over here are like 90 cents for a tin. Yeah. Um, we were like, what's the point in like growing it and preserving yeah. it all ourselves? But then it was like, you know, it hasn't been sprayed or, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you know what has gone on with it really. Cause you've watched it the whole way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of, you do need to weigh up the fact that like, costs really mm. like what you can and can't afford to really do. Um, preserving in jars, you know, you got to go get the jars. I don't know what it's like over there, but we used to mm. be able to pick up second-hand preserving jars with dirt cheap. And I yeah. went in the other day and they've gone through the roof. I'm yeah. Like, Everyone needs to stop. I think that's COVID for <laughs> so, you. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's right. I've got to go find some cows now. I went to the op shop. I don't know what you call them over there, but like the second hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same thing. <laughs> Thrift store kind of Pretty thing. Much the op shop or a second hand store. Yeah. And um, luckily before COVID, so my birthday's in November. And so November prior to COVID, I said to my husband, I wanted to go to the op shop and just buy a crap load of jars. <laughs> um, and yeah. so I did. And um, I literally filled up the back of the car <laughs> and they're like 10 cents yeah. each, but I could imagine, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I can imagine now there's probably none left um, online. Mm-hmm. There's no new jars left. Um, you can't get ball Mason no, here no. because um, they're just, all the Americans want them. So they're not yeah. even exporting them. <laughs> no. um, and uh, I went and got some of the the bigger ones, like yeah, not the small way ones, the big big ones. They I bought some before lockdown. 
think I got them for like two dollars each. Wow. Um, no, now they're now they're six bucks. That's still cheap. I paid for sixteen a for a jar for for a one and a half liter jar, sixteen dollars for. Oh, that really? was pre lockdown. I can't imagine what they are now. Oh God. Okay, I won't <laughs> complain about. That. They were new though. Um, I you can't find them secondhand here. Um. Yeah, insane. Oh. Um, so I've done, I have do, do a wee bit of that mainly with tomatoes. Um, but I think people get too caught up in the whole canning, preserving and jars thing. Like mm. most of it, you can store it in the freezer. Yeah. Um, which is cheaper because you don't yeah. have to go do all these jars and you don't have to deal with some of the recipes can be quite scary as well. And you mm. just think like, is that going to last on the shelf for a whole year? Um, yeah. But I think if you're just starting, like just freeze some stuff, see mm. how you go, see what you eat and what you don't eat. Yeah. Don't stress about preserving jars. And, and some things you don't even need to preserve. They preserve themselves like mm. garlic and potatoes. Like, yeah. You don't have to do anything, which, yeah. is hard, which is the good part. Someone mentioned to me that they let um, zucchinis turn into marrows um, and they store yeah. through the winter for 12 months. And I'm like, here I am trying to freeze these zucchinis, which have turned to rubber because I didn't blanch them, um, when yeah. I could just leave them in, you know, in a cool spot and hopefully they'll last for most of winter when not much else is, really? is growing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to, um, because I've got so many plants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh I'm gonna let I'm gonna leave some and dedicate them to just making marrows for winter yeah because I'm just you know I'm pretty done with zucchinis and I've still got another two ish months left <laughs> oh, you're gonna have uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah but I, I um I preserved quite a few tomatoes in the freezer last year we had all that smoke from the bushfires um and it was yeah. a fairly cool summer anyway. I'm not sure why we didn't have a La Nina. Um, it was really wet in my part of Victoria as well. Um, and so I didn't have any tomatoes ripen on the vine. And out of like 150 tomato bushes, I got maybe 200 kilos of tomatoes, which sounds like a lot, but off the quantity of plants I had really wasn't. Um, so I froze them as they ripened inside. Um, and then I was able to just pull them out as I needed them through winter. And that actually worked really, really well. Yeah, see, that's the thing. It's different for everyone. Like you might go through, we don't, we hardly eat any jam here. Yeah. Um, but other people might go through like a bottle of jam a day kind of thing, uh, yeah. a week. So um, it's just, it's up to like your own personal needs as to what you what and how I guess you mm. preserve things yeah that's true um you were talking about your walk-in fridge um I think you call them a chiller over there <laughs> um, we've got the same thing we call it a cool room um and I had been considering using that to store um veg in that I wanted to overwinter um but you were talking about potentially using your chiller to yeah store or your summer produce yeah well I don't really have anywhere else to put it um the garage on the house and our small shed that they just get too hot yeah um it wouldn't work to keep like I, I told you I kept those pumpkins in the garage a couple of years ago and mm. they all started to go rotten um, mm. on the bottoms so I'm gonna give it a go in this it is it is a walk-in freezer chiller fridge whatever you want to call it um, yeah but it, obviously it doesn't work um mm. it's not even hooked up to like the refrigeration unit or anything so yeah you're never gonna like have to need to turn it on or anything yeah so I'm gonna give that a go there's some shelves and things in there that I can use so mm. hopefully and it does stay cool in there, so hopefully yeah. it stays cool enough. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be right with you um, 
trialing my one because I um I stored <laughs> my pumpkins on the western side of my house, which doesn't get much sun in winter. Um, and I had birds and parrots come in and just take a bite out of each, and it was really disappointing because I lost a heap of pumpkins. Yes, I cut off like the affected bit because it was literally like a one centimeter bite, but it was enough to yeah. break that seal. Um, that would let my pumpkins last through winter into spring. Yeah. And so I cut the bad bit off, but I had all these pumpkins that I had to kind of process in a really short amount of time when I didn't want to be using them because I had summer produce coming out of the garden. Um, and that was really yeah. frustrating. So I need something that's mice proof because we get um, an awesome flush of mice and rats and field mice out here and safe from birds um, that yeah would also damage them yeah no. yeah we do get um mice and rats and things but like and manage they're kind of manageable yeah then there's heaps and heaps of them yeah when we first moved here before any gardening or anything was getting done yeah there so many mice yeah um but once you get on top of them, it's all right here. Yeah. And they don't have, we don't have any, because um, you've got that bush block that backs onto your place. Don't yeah. We? Yeah. We don't have any of that here. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's reasonably like open. Like they're not going to really migrate out of anywhere. So yeah. Fingers cross it stays that way. <laughs> yeah. They're not fun to deal with. They, um, they like to go into my hothouse and eat my seeds and seedlings and seedlings I plant out in the garden. Um, mm. If it gets really bad, um, sometimes I'll eat the produce in the garden. Yeah. It's really frustrating. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I've, I've had to resort, like we tried trapping them and we'll trap like five to six in a night, but it wasn't mm. enough. It made no difference. So we had to try baiting them. But we have lots of owls here. We've got lots of snakes um, and other things that prey on birds like kookaburras and, and all that, you know, all that sort yeah. of stuff, wildlife that could be affected by secondary poisoning, plus the dog and the cat. Um, but we had no choice but to bait. We had them start coming in the house and I couldn't handle it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. I don't think there's many people that can handle that. <laughs> um, and it, we just had to bait. And so, um, um, yeah, I was just going to say that a farmer across the road, he mentioned that um, there's two different types of baits you can get here. There's like a green bait and a red bait. And I was only using one type. I didn't realise there was a difference other than colour. <laughs> but the different colours yeah. show a different um, active chemical in there, basically, that kills the rats. And so one week I'd put out the red ones and then I'll take all the red ones away and then I'll put out the green ones because once the first lot of rats or mice die, the nest smell what's killed them and they won't touch that. So it's kind of like a, I suppose, a, what do you call evolution? Like this is why they yeah. so prolific is because they go, oh, well, that isn't good for us to eat, so I'm not going to eat it. Um, and so by yeah. alternating the baits, I was able to get on top of them. It took me a year. Mm. Um, last autumn, they came back again, which they always do. Um, but throughout winter, I just couldn't get on top of the rats and mice um, up until spring. And it was only when they told me that trick was I able to get rid of the, the mice in such a bad proportion. They're still here. Like they're still over at the sheds and, and stuff, but they're not. Yeah. Um, in my zone one, in my growing area, um, or in my house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know we've got some um, at the moment. They're down. We I get my wheat off a farmer down the road for the yeah. chickens, so it comes in one big um, half ton bag. Yeah, and it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't open and close the container doors very well. Yeah. So they were never. Um, mm. So there's a few mice in there. But that's like, you know, that's down in the shed. And if you leave food out for them, they're going to come That's back, right. So. Yeah. And, so, and they can't find that food anymore because they're over at the sheds no. because that's where we compost and we cold compost. So it doesn't break down as quickly as, um, as a hot compost does. So um, 
yeah, that's where our cold comp composting bays are if we can't get to the um, making hot compost. And um, if that's not there, then they'll come over here and they find seeds in the thousands because I sow thousands of seeds at the time and, you know, makes them happy and breed well. Let's <laughs> where dinner is. We'll go there. Sorry? They go, oh, that's where dinner is. We'll yeah, go there. that's right. Easy meal. <laughs> um, we don't really have many, like, predating pests like that here. Um Although last night I did hear a possum and oh, it was yeah. too close to my garden for my likings. <laughs> yeah. So that guy will probably have to go. Okay. Because you guys keep protect possums uh -huh. over there. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We but they're, are they um, native? Are they native possums? Yeah. No, so and I'm pretty sure they're different to the ones you guys have. Um, so the, yeah. the possums here are native. And some of them are really cute and they don't cause damage. And some of them are really ugly and they do cause damage, but they're still protected. You can't kill them. Um, and they're really yeah. prevalent through trade um, suburban areas. We haven't had them here um, on our farm, but I think our neighbours had one or two. Um, but, yeah, not where I am. I think because it's not very trade, like it's not natively trade around the, the property. Um, mm. So, yeah, there haven't been an issue here, but do you guys eat them? Is that like, no, Not okay. Really. I mean, you like, <laughs> could if you want to. Yeah. But um, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you're hungry, yeah. But... <laughs> um, a lot of people over winter in New Zealand will um, – go out and trap them and we're able to sell their either plucked fur or um, skins. Okay. Which is um, like another income for some people, but mm. that's a lot of work. And yeah, the price has, the price had dropped because um, we sell like a lot of possum merino mm -hmm. type like fabrics and stuff. So um, with no tourists coming in, we, yeah. I think less of those products were being sold. So the price went down a wee bit. Yeah. But no, we don't like them here. And there's big um, controversy over the poison 1080 that they okay. drop um, yeah. to kill them. Out in like all the, um, all the, what do they call them? Reserves, not reserves, like yeah. um, public land and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we use 1080 here, but I wasn't aware that, well, I suppose it's, it depends what bait you put it in, but they use it. We've got a lot of wild dogs in the forest next to us and a lot of yeah. foxes. Um, but I think it's mainly used for the wild dogs. So that's what it's advertised as. Um, so we've got to be real careful keeping our dogs out of the forest. Like even if we were to go into the forest um, ourselves, um, I'm always very um pedantic of you know dog on lead or dog in car um because they put the yeah. sausages for for the dogs to find but i guess oh. yeah possums wouldn't really go for sausages so maybe that's how how they kind of <laughs> um make sure that they're safe from it i guess god it's so different isn't it yeah but yeah wild dogs have been a real issue here so our neighbor on the hill um we haven't noticed dogs up where our animals are. I'm sure they track through our forest a bit um, through the creek and stuff, but our neighbour has had them chase their calves um, up on the hill. Um, thankfully, yeah, we haven't noticed anything happen to our sheep because um, they're, they're crossed with dingoes. So they're a domestic dog and they're crossed with dingoes and they can't bark and they can't howl. So they scream apparently. And it's really loud and really terrifying when they come onto your property. Mm. <laughs> no, I think our only problem really is the odd possum. That's about it. We don't have to compete with anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's good that you guys are able to, like any um, introduced species, it's good to eradicate them. Like the introduced species on our property alone would be rabbits, deer and foxes and the dogs, um, mm. which can all cause their own issues. But thankfully they haven't, they haven't come up to my um, 
to the areas that we grow food. We have had foxes visit, but you get that in suburbia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, do you have any tips for someone who wants to start their own self-sufficient journey? Um, oh, yeah. It would be it, because it's so different. Like, obviously, you could live in town mm. or you could live out in the country or whichever. But my one thing I would do that I found like the easiest to do was um, find a substitute. So like Mm -hmm. something you would normally buy from the store. Yeah. Just pick like one thing and like research about it. If it's just making muesli bars. Yeah. Instead of buying like just something small, start, Mm. start very, very small. Yeah. And see how you go. Yeah. Um, I'm doing it at the moment with just like some bread that we normally buy. So yeah. I'm just trialing like different recipes and things like that to mm. get one that I, I like because then I can stop buying it once yeah. I know how to make it. I'm good at making it. Mm. Um, it would it'd be start real small. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. I The lady I was speaking to yesterday, Teeny from um Cassio Lino um she's in Germany and she said the same thing it's so easy to dream big and go big and then be completely overwhelmed with not only the amount of work you have to do in growing it or making it um but mm. you have to preserve it and store it um and it can just get too much and it's easy to be discouraged as well I've certainly been there yeah. I've jumped in I always jump in head first <laughs> <laughs> just I who I am <laughs> um but there's but no time you get, like so excited and it's just like yeah. a new exciting thing and yeah if you had like a bottomless wallet like you could yeah. do whatever you want that's but, exactly um, right <laughs> no everyone's got a different kind of situation that yeah. they're in like yeah. you could be on a quarter acre section in town mm. and trying to do it so mm. it's really different for everyone yeah that's right agreed I think not being or not putting yourself in a situation where you're overwhelmed and starting small is probably a really good piece of advice um because mm. I could see a lot of people who started a COVID garden could possibly be in the yeah. situation of being <laughs> overwhelmed um, especially if they're trying yeah. to grow from seed like it took me over 10 years to learn how to grow brassicas from seed and tomatoes from seed um, yeah, I never used to grow from seed. I know my first year gardening, I didn't grow from seed. Yeah. I bought all my seedlings. Yeah. And there was, because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, exactly right. And it takes a long time to get in that rhythm. Um, so I feel like a lot of those new gardeners that wanted to have some sort of self-sufficiency um, in case the supermarket couldn't, um, you know, wasn't able to keep up with demand which they weren't at some stage last year um and maybe they are overwhelmed with things going wrong you know having a wet summer here this year very different conditions to what it's going to be like next summer quite possibly Mm. I mean you can't guarantee that but I could imagine that next summer is not going to be this wet um well we've had a really good summer and like by now it's normally brown outside yeah it's still green yeah same so been an unbelievable summer really yeah and they're like what one in ten years they are here I don't know about New Zealand yeah I don't know and last time it was this green in February yeah (laughs) it's doing pretty well but yeah those gardeners they've probably had like a really really good year and their plants Mm. have probably boomed yeah. And yeah, it doesn't stop in the gardening outside. Like mm. you still have to come inside and into the kitchen. I reckon it would probably be 50 50 your time mm. outside and your time in the kitchen. Yeah. Cooking absolutely. it into something that's actually edible as yeah. a meal. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
I can hands down agree with that. <laughs> it's really time consuming. Mm. And I think that's really overlooked. Yeah. Like if you took into account the amount of time you spent on your five tomato plants, like, I don't know, watering them every two, three mm. days or whichever. Yeah. Compared to the amount of time you'd have to spend, like, if you're wanting to, like, preserve them and, like, canning them, mm. that takes a long time. Yeah. And then that's not where that finishes. Like, once it's on the shelf, it's still not finished because yeah. you haven't eaten it yet. So <laughs> yeah, you've still right. got to, like, put it into a meal. So, yeah, it's, I think it's very underestimated. Mm. Yep. And the amount of time it takes to harvest or water. For me, harvesting is a big one. It can take me hours in the morning, especially in peak tomato season, yeah. to get all the tomatoes oh. off the bush, yeah. But, I mean, I brought it on myself. We're talking about being overwhelmed. I planted over 100 tomato bushes. I mean, uh, I'm the sucker who did that, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's um, your own fault. <laughs> Oh, yeah I think I I only normally plant about um I think there's about six out there yeah when I say six like they're huge yeah. plants <laughs> like massive um they take up half my raised um garden bed yeah and that's enough like <laughs> at this stage I can't deal with any more than that amount because mm. I think I had I had a similar amount last year and I didn't get like a heap of a heap of them but mm. it was enough for me to be like that's enough <laughs> like I don't want to put any more in like until you get better at them so yeah. like next year I'm not planting that variety again because I hate mm-hmm. it yeah, we get such bad ones here, and they're such a tall plant. Yeah, they just all are constantly blowing over, mm. no matter how well you buy them up. Yeah, um, so that's I don't want to battle <laughs> with these tomato plants. Yeah. So I'm not doing them next year. Yeah. If I found like a more manageable variety mm. that that I really liked, mm. um, then yeah, I I could probably plant like the whole new ground bed and tomatoes if I want but yeah I'm not doing it for those ones <laughs> yeah uh we found the typing eggs are nice and short mm. um so if you look for the determinant variety so the indeterminate variety this was all new to me a couple of years ago um I had no idea there were different types of tomato plants yeah <laughs> um but they're more of a bush variety oh. so they don't grow at all like um the other ones um and they've been really yeah. good um, really good producers but it's just yeah finding what works for you I was speaking to uh, Steph from Indara Farms in WA and she gets 280 mils of rainfall a year which is insane insanely low um, but she said in her climate she can't prune her tomatoes like everyone here does because we prune them because it's really wet and they can get fungal diseases over there she prunes them her tomatoes get sunburnt and they rot on the vine so it's, you know, each yeah. different climate and each different situation um, has a different application. Even we're, yeah. we're both in Australia, we're both in Southern Australia, but her climate is so different to mine um, that, yeah, it's, it's learning how to garden in your own climate. Yeah. And <laughs> oh, these tomato plants, like I've, I have to prune the crap out of them because they just put off so many leaves. Um, but for like all those new gardeners out there that put in like a COVID garden, um, yeah. I just, yeah, like they probably jumped into it, grabbed whatever from the, like, mm. because everyone would have been buying seedlings and seeds and things yeah. like that. Um, the pro- they, they could have picked like, terrible varieties like yeah. it was such a rush that there was no planning and things yeah. like that so yeah I get I think it's the best thing is to experiment with the varieties but mm. this is my second year on these tomatoes um next year I'm not doing them so yeah 
yeah you do what works for you in you your don't situation. Know you try yeah that's right awesome thank you so much for chatting with us today um it's been really nice touching on um homesteading in a different way i think a lot of people uh um, grow a lot of their veg but not many people do their own meat um, and it's sometimes a conscientious topic because it can stir up emotions in people um, a lot of people say to me how do you eat all these animals that you raised from babies and loved I'm like well what's the difference from eating um, an animal that's been unloved potentially unloved just the number in the paddock and it's in plastic in the supermarket what's the difference I know where mine's come mm. from. I know how they've lived their life. But mm. I think that's a difficult thing for some people to get their head around. So it's been nice to talk about that um, and that it is normal. It's not abnormal to rear your, your own mate. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's what well, that's how I was, we were really grew up that way. So, I mean, I still have pets. Mm. I mean, Bella... Bella will be a forever yeah. cow here till she dies of natural causes of yeah. old age, whatever. But, um, you can still have pets. Like, yeah, that's right. Every animal out there, to be honest, like majority of the animals out there are my pets. So mm-hmm. um, <laughs> we've got pet lambs from two years ago that mm-hmm. are still here. Yeah. So it's when it can come across more sounds meaner than what it really is like <laughs> yeah. <can't laughs> yeah that's right and we have um you know I've got my bottle my bottle fed lambs there's no way I could eat my bottle fed lambs you just yeah. get so attached to them exactly. and they have their own personality yeah. um yeah yeah <laughs> I will no, um I will make sure I'll link, you've got a blog coming out soon. So I'll link that below and so everyone can keep their eye on that. And I'll link your Instagram page too and people can follow you there and watch your adventures, especially with your new house cow potentially and how that all goes. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can keep up with all your, you've got gorgeous lambs there. They're different, a different breed to what we have here. Um, but you've got, uh, do you still have goats? Yes, I've decided to stop breeding goats, so I've just got four pet ones. Nice, yeah. And they can keep up with your goats and your sheep and your cows and all the adventures you have on your farm growing food.